Let's, uh, let's go ahead and bring the study before the Lord in prayer. And Father God, um, and just as, again, as we enter into your word today, we, we look forward to seeing, Lord, what you've prepared for each one of us. <laughs> um, completely outside of anything that's going to come out of my mouth, Lord, completely outside of anything that's in the notes, we know, Lord, that it is your Holy Spirit that teaches each one of us and that ministers to us. And, and in that, Lord, you know exactly what you need each one of us to hear. You know exactly what you want to say to each one of us. And, and in that, um, we, just, we give this time to you with, with open ears and with open hearts, Lord. Um, we just ask that our focus would be entirely, entirely on you, um, that we wouldn't be distracted by anything else, that, we just, that, that you, Lord, just speaking your word to us, that would be um, what rules this morning and, and truly what rules through the rest of the week and in the different moments we're each going to come up against, Lord. We realize you're going to be giving us words right now. You're going to have a share with other people this week um, that you're going to draw up as we run in, into different instances and incidents throughout the week. You, you are equipping us through this word, Lord, for, for the work that you're going to do this week. Um, and it is a sheltering work. It is a it is a protecting work. It is an outreaching work, Lord. You are always drawing others unto yourself. You're always building us up and edifying us. So we just, we submit our hearts unto you this morning. We just ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we have at this point now, we, we've been in 1 Corinthians for seven months at this point. We're, we're, we're drawing in toward the home stretch of the book. We still got quite a bit ahead of us, but, but for seven months now, We've been working through the front end of Paul's letter to the believers in Corinth. And throughout, as we've gone through, and you know this very well by now, throughout it's been drawing to the surface each of the different issues that were, that were facing that church in, in, in particular, that, that that church was contending with. But as we've seen, every single one of these issues very much addresses this church today, the modern church, the local church even, the individual hearts. God has been communicating a whole lot of things to us through this. And each issue that we've seen addressed through the first 11 chapters of this book. Each issue that we've seen at the root, it's boiled down at some level to self. And we should know that very well by now. It's to service of self, um, whatever it may be. But, but in each case, it's just been a matter of carnality. And that idea of pursuing the desires of the flesh instead of walking after the desires of the Spirit of God, walking after the Spirit himself. And the theme that we've had through this book comes out of Romans chapter 8, verse 6, which says, to, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. And as we've said, working through these middle chapters now, the, really the heart of the book, through, from chapters 12 through 14, we're, we're seeing in all this what it is to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. And for a couple of weeks now, we've been going into detail about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the, the different ways that the Holy Spirit works through life, and that he works in a, in a fellowship, how that looks and, and how it rolls out. <laughs> and through the course of this letter, we've seen among this Corinthian church specifically, they were not lacking in these gifts. It wasn't a matter of, why don't you have these gifts? It, that wasn't what they were lacking. But in all of it, their exercise of the gifts left a lot to be desired. The exercise itself needed to be addressed and needed to be set in order. In this chapter this morning, you probably know this chapter very well. It's a very famous chapter, right? Specifically verses 4 through about the first three words or so of verse 8. I mean, very commonly. You probably had this, 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 this section read at your wedding. I wouldn't be surprised if that were true. You see these verses plastered all over wall decor and coffee mugs. It's a very famous set of scriptures, and they are great verses. They are great verses. They can certainly stand on their own, and, and they communicate remarkable and deep and beautiful truth just in and of themselves. But as we enter in, I, just, I want you to keep in mind the context you know, as we read these words. These were not, as we read them, these were not breathy aspirations as, as to what love should be, you know, with violins playing in the background or something. This, this was a setting in order that Paul is rolling out here as, as a part of a, a greater text that was serving to call the people out for the way that they were living their lives. As, as we read these verses, understand this was a rebuke that they were receiving. <laughs> Essentially, you're losing sight of this. 
what's about to follow here. And Paul is calling them back. This is where you need to be. This is where you need to be to adequately live this life for Jesus Christ. And as we enter in, for us, it's an earnest pause for, for reflection, you know, as we enter in. Where are we? Where are each one of us? Where am I today as we consider these things? But where we closed last week, you know, we were, we were exhorted to earnestly desire the best gifts. And as we said, literally the word there for best, it is the nobler gifts, the unseen things, the the shapeless things that God lays on your heart to do. Last week was all about establishing what noble even is in the eyes of our Lord. People, it's in all this, we talked about it, we, we want the things that are most useful rather than the things that are spectacular to the viewing audience, so to speak. People are so prone to be bowled over by the signs and by the wonders, but so much of the steadfastness and the the faithfulness of our God and the patience of our God is conveyed in the quiet things and the steadfast things, the faithful things, the things he calls us to. And we close with these words last week, and yet I will show you a more excellent way. And that word excellent, the, the word that was used in the Greek manuscripts, it is the word hyperbole, and not at all to be confused with the word hyperbole. Okay? That word, hyperbole, it is an exaggeration or overstatement. Hooperbole, what we see here with this word excellent, it literally translates to to throw beyond all others. It is a supereminence in the way that it is defined. It is beyond even a preeminence. Something supremely remarkable in the way this is communicated here. I will show you the supremely remarkable way. The way that surpasses all others. For everything that we've seen as far as how the Holy Spirit manifests its work in a life, Paul's going to reset a very basic foundation here in all of it. You know, an area where the Corinthian church had fallen off its moorings. An area, very frankly, where each one of us, we tend to fall so frequently and so utterly short. And what he's going to say here is that for all the clamoring and all the debating over the best way to do things, he's going to say here there is no better way in any part of life, in any venue of life, in any relationship that you have, in any circumstance in life, there is no better way than the way that's about to be rolled out for us right here. It is a super eminence. <laughs> in chapter 13, verse 1 here, it says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become a sounding brass, I'm sorry, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And as we've talked about in all this tongues, the gift of tongues, being able to speak in a language, whether it be of men or of angels, one that you have no training in, it, that gift particularly had been brought front and center among the Corinthian church. And the crux, uh, the context of these middle chapters as we go through, they're really geared towards setting that specific gift back in order. Because the people were beginning to value that gift over all the others. And they were looking down on anybody who didn't express or manifest that gift. They were even attempting to disqualify from the faith those who didn't have that specific gift. And that still happens today. You know, people will get, they'll start holding up a particular gift, whatever it might be. And they start, it's, it starts creating all kinds of discord and division amongst a group of believers. Well, I've got this and you don't, so I must be better than you. That's not the way God works. And Paul, in addressing that particular attitude, he is balancing the scales back out here. <laughs> we'll see in chapter 14, and I'm not trying to gloss over the gift of tongues at all, but chapter 14 really breaks down into the particulars of how that gift is executed in any group, if it should be executed at all. And so kind of kind of keep, keep that bookmark we've been holding since we started in chapter 12, keep it till we get to chapter 14. And so what we're going to see in that is, is, it, is a gift there that is specifically given for speaking to God. And it's going to go into great detail in chapter 14 about how if there is no accompanying interpretation of such a gift, then there is no understanding. And in that, how can anybody agree or be edified by what's being said. We're going to see a specific order that will be outlined for that specific gift. But one of the key phrases through that section of Scripture is that we will see there, God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. 
And that prevails over everything else when we consider the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And the encouragement there will be to utilize the gifts which edify the whole. But that's next, next time. It's not even next week. It's when we get to chapter 14. Even deeper than the order and the practice of the gifts, Paul here is addressing the root of any of it. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging symbol. And Paul's unfolding here a point that's going to unfold over quite some time, but basically to exercise any of the gifts of the Spirit. You know, in this case, tongues, but to do so without love, it's just a whole lot of noise with no accompanying meaning. So you get, a, you get an actual story from me this morning. This is a rarity. <laughs> I was uh, so cool in college that I was a member of not one, but two marching bands. <laughs> <laughs> one of them in Texas and one here in Nevada. I was, I, I was in the band and I was an RA. So, I mean, nobody wanted to talk to me ever. I mean, I was either wearing a fuzzy plume out of my hat or I was breaking up their party, you know? So it, it's both. If it was a really good day, I'd break up the party while wearing the hat. But, um, <laughs> but, but in Texas, if football is the national sport of Texas. You know, college stadiums there, they range from 50,000 to I think 105 is the biggest one now, 105,000 seats in Texas. And they fill them all to the brim on any given Saturday, absolutely full to the brim. So to hear the marching band at one of those, you know, you need an enormous, enormous ensemble to be able to actually hear the band above all the noise that 50,000 to 100,000 people can generate. So generally speaking, that equates to anywhere between 200 to 300 musicians. I think the biggest band in Texas right now is Texas A&M. They weigh in above 440 musicians in their band. And when all of those musicians, that, when you have that great a number, all of them on the same page, each one of them playing their part under the, under the same direction, it's an impressive thing. You can hear it on TV. It, it, it's a beautiful thing. But what you don't hear at the game. What you don't hear on TV is, is when that group is warming up, <laughs> that, that group of 300, 400 people. Everybody's just doing their own thing, getting tuned up and noodling on their instruments, you know. I just want you to picture for a moment, I think there's something like 250 seats in this room, okay? So picture every seat in this room filled with a musician holding a very loud horn, okay? And then, and then double it. Uh, double it, uh, just, just, just for the sake of the example. You know, everybody holding a loud instrument, and every single one of them is doing their own thing at full volume, okay? You can't, it, it's chaos. It's chaos. You can't even begin to hear yourself think. You figure out of 300 musicians, more than half of them play a brass instrument. You know, a trumpet, or a trombone, or, or a mellophone, or a sousaphone. <laughs> when, when you get all that brass sounding however they want to sound, all at once. It's a mess. It's a mess. It, it, nobody in the world wants to hear that. I think in our particular band down in Texas, we had 10 cymbal players, 10 of them. <laughs> and in the context of, of the selected musical piece, when it's arranged for 300 musicians, 10 cymbal players is awesome. It does exactly what it's supposed to do. But when you give 10 college freshmen a, <laughs> a pair of five-pound marching cymbals and you don't give them any other rules or parameters, what are they going to do? <laughs> they're going to crash the cymbals. I mean, they're going to crash them off each other, off each other's heads and off the walls and together repeatedly and loudly. It's a joyful noise only for the guys playing the cymbals. You know, for everybody else, it's agony. <laughs> and in what Paul is saying here, you know, to, to exercise this gift without love, it may make a whole lot of noise. It may be impressive noise. It may draw every single person's attention in the room, but it is making that attention in the worst way. It is making the noise in the worst way. It's beyond indistinguishable. And people around you, they just start flinching with every crash of those symbols. And what was intended as an accent to, to punctuate the greater whole, uh, to the, the ordered symphonic work, it ends up being a nuisance, a woeful, woeful distraction. I mean, you may be doing the absolute best that you know how to do. You may be playing them absolutely right, you know, giving it all your effort. But when it's not held to a basic standard, and the basic standard of God's love, when it's out of line with a central purpose, when it's exercised out of the proper order, it has the right sound, but it's being made in all the wrong places, when it's beholden not to a single director, 
You know, no matter how loud, no matter how exuberant, no matter how skilled even, it is indiscernible to anyone else. It is a sounding brass, a clanging cymbal. And Paul is saying here, in whatever word spoken, and for them at the time, a word spoken in tongues was held out above all others, but in whatever word spoken, if that word is not rooted in love, it's a terrible noise for anybody listening, for anybody who might hear it. So, so see that this morning. I mean, lay that concept as a measuring rod over every single one of your words, any of your words. You know, so many of our words are digital anymore whether it be the texting or on the social media. You know, you, you don't know on social media. You don't know who's seeing your words. You don't know in that or, or how your words are impacting someone else. We become a generation of very over-eager symbol players when you look at it honestly. Every time we press that little blue send arrow, you know, it's just a big crash of the symbols. Crash, <laughs> crash, all day long. It doesn't matter how much of Jesus you might share. And it doesn't matter how much truth might be in your words if they're not dispensed in love. If your words contain snark or bitterness, even justified, you know, if your words contain defiance or pride or self-righteousness, if your words even unintentionally belittle anyone else or diminish anyone else, every careless, thoughtless word is just crash, crash, crash completely overwhelms any other truth you possibly could speak. Just a big tuba blast. Start seeing your uncareful words that way. (laughs) We tend to dilute the most powerful words we have with words spoken without an ounce of love to them. And in all this, I mean, understand, this is so important to understand this morning. This isn't like, hey, be better than that. Okay, That's not the message this morning, because we aren't better than that. But our Lord is. And so many of our words collectively right now, they have no bearing and no root in God's heart, in his love. But if we just be quick to turn to him before we speak, if we be quick to use him as the filter for the words that come out of our mouth, his words then overwhelm all of the insufficiency of our own words. David pleaded with God, In Psalm 143, verse 8, he said, Cause me to hear your loving kindness in the morning, for in you I do trust. Cause me to know the way in which I should walk, for I lift up my soul to you. Trust in God. And the message here isn't be better. It is be quicker to turn to God. Trust in God, and it will all be okay. It's okay to ask God such a thing. Cause me to hear your loving kindness in the morning. Cause me to hear your loving kindness and whatever I come up against. And his loving kindness then is what will translate out of your mouth, if that's what you're hearing. Cause me to know the way in which I should walk. God will be faithful to do so whenever you ask him that. And he will be faithful to speak the same to others through you. Love is the sheet music that brings all the instruments into harmony with each other. Our God intends balance and fullness in the way that ministry is carried out. He intends balance and fullness in any life given over to him. But without love, you might as well just go and buy yourself a set of marching cymbals. Start crashing away whenever you want to talk, because that's all anybody's going to hear. (laughs) And love here, you know, it's not a subjective term. Well, I'll be more loving in the way that I speak. we, We get into so much trouble when we start defining our own version of love. It's not a subjective term. It's not however you choose to define the word. It's not however you decide is most comfortable to live that word out. You see so many today who define love by their own standards, (laughs) and then they try and translate that love onto God. And in doing so, they, they, they begin to start defining God by their own standards. I challenge you this morning, I I dare you to love God for who he actually is, for who he says he is in his word, and not for who you feel he should be. Trust his word. Trust his word to define the picture of who he actually is. Because in all that, we will see in his word he is bigger than our understanding, and he's deeper than our strength, you know, and he is better than our hearts. Bottom line. His love is perfect in ways we can't begin to imagine. 
Whereas our love, in and of ourselves, our love will always fall short. So we're going to get into a very distinct definition of love in just a minute here. And so again, one you know very well already. But that definition, it will fall in line with something that we see repeatedly in Scripture, which is simply that as, as opposed to us attempting to translate our faulty love onto God, instead God translates his perfect love onto us. And that's the, that's the love we need to live with, is the one that we can't produce in and of ourselves. Because God is the very definition of love. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 7 and 8, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. So love is of God, but more so God is love. Throughout this section, when we see this word love, what we're seeing here in the, in the Greek, the word is agape. And yet it's a word you guys have heard a million times. <laughs> but it's a word in and of itself. It's a word that speaks of a self-sacrificing love, an unconditional love, a giving without any expectation of return. And we've talked about this before. The word itself, it translates literally to a love feast. And that's fascinating to me. You think about what a feast is. Uh, especially in that particular day, the host would bear the entire cost of the feast for anybody who would attend, for anybody who would answer the call, anybody who would partake, the one who hosted the feast would bear the cost for all of them. It's a, it's a simple and a perfect descriptor of God's love, you know, of the table and the banquet that God brings us to in the name of Jesus Christ. He has borne all of the cost on our behalf to provide for us everything we'd ever need to partake of. And his love, always, it will invite still more and more to that table. Anyone who would hear of his love to come and partake of that same feast. So if I speak but have not that love, all my words are sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. <laughs> and in verse 2 here it says, And though I have the gift of prophecy... And understand all mysteries and all knowledge. And though I have faith, all faith, so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. So you can have the gift of prophecy, you know, the, the ability to readily speak forth God's word. You could have the gift of discernment, the ability to understand all mysteries. You could have the gift of the word of knowledge. You could have the gift of faith, so much so that you could move mountains. I heard, I'm going to blatantly steal Joe Foch in this. I heard Joe Foch say this week, if someone has faith enough to move mountains but doesn't have love, I don't want to be anywhere near that person, unless the mountain come down on me. <laughs> you could have the gift of giving. You could give away all of your goods readily, and eagerly, you could give well past the point of your own well-being, but without love. Without this love feast, this self-sacrificial, unconditional love, it does no actual good. We could be each gifted beyond measure. And this church was in Corinth. But without love, without agape, you're nothing. And it launches into the definition here in verse 4. Love, agape, suffers long. And is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. Is not puffed up. So love, this kind of love specifically, it's patient. And I think if we just dwelt on that one word, that love suffers long. We just dwelt on that, we could spend weeks trying to figure out the right reflection of that type of love. <laughs> it suffers long. It's willing to wait indefinitely regardless of the circumstances around you, despite what we may think we see happening, and despite what we may think we don't see happening. <laughs> so much of what God does in a life, this is so important to understand, so much of what God does in a life happens below the surface. It happens in the heart, with no, uh, at the outset, no outer evidence. And the, and the whole time he's molding and shaping and moving long before anyone else can see anything on the surface. He, our God works in patience, and he works in, in long-suffering. 
He knows the end. Always. He knows exactly where he's going with a particular soul. And he's willing to wait for his work to come to complete fruition in his perfect timing. Love is patient. <laughs> Love is kind. As we go through this list, understand anything missing, any one of these elements, is not love. Not by the definition we're given here in Scripture. And you, and you can't have anything else on this list we're about to receive. You can't have any of it if there's not first patience and kindness. They, they color almost every other facet that grows out of those two seeds right there. Patient and kind. Patient and kind. It does not envy. <laughs> There's not a whole lot of need to expound a whole lot here. The text just cuts so simply to the heart of so many things that are deep-rooted in our lives. It does not parade itself. It is not puffed up. It doesn't seek attention. It's not proud. Love does not behave rudely. Verse 5, it does not seek its own. It is not provoked. It thinks no evil. So it's not short. And it's not careless, it's not selfish, and it's not self-centered. As we've already seen, this idea of agape, it speaks of a complete disregard for self. It doesn't matter what I get in return when we talk about this type of love. It doesn't matter if I get anything in return. This is simply what I'm glad to give. And it's simply what our God was glad to give us first. Love is not provoked. It doesn't have a quick trigger. That one nails just about each one of us, right? <laughs> you can't set true love. You know, you can't set agape love off. You, you don't have to tiptoe around it on eggshells. <laughs> it thinks no evil. Verse 6 here, it does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Love doesn't rejoice in any evil. It doesn't, it doesn't revel in injustice. It doesn't gloat when others are receiving their they're well-deserved justice, but instead it rejoices in the truth. Love rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, verse 7. It believes all things. It hopes all things. It endures all things. And all, you see that word all four times there. It's the, that's the key word. The word in the Greek is paz. It's all-inclusive. Literally, it's inclusive of all forms subsequent. Love bears all things. Okay, and that word bears, that in the Greek is the word stego, which means literally to roof over and to cover with silence. It's a word that speaks of, of building a shelter. So in this sense, it's building a shelter over any hurts incurred to yourself and building a shelter over the harms that you have incurred or over whatever fracture may occur between parties. A love like this will do nothing to dig the fault lines deeper. And we are so prone to do that. <laughs> Instead, though, this, a love like this covers over, it builds a roof over or a shelter over those cracks. A love like this mends and, and heals in all things, all things. And 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8 says, And above all things have fervent love, have fervent agape for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. But we read here, love believes all things. It's not cynical. It's not distrusting. It, it believes the best for whoever you come into contact with. It hopes the best, thinks the best of a situation in all things. And love endures all things. Literally, it abides. We've talked about that word frequently, abide, to put down deep roots. <laughs> love puts down deep roots to weather the, the fullness of the storm in all things. This is the love, you know, not just that comes from our God. And this is the love that our God is in his very nature. I heard a, an apt application this week. I blatantly stole this too. I stole like 80% of the study. But <laughs> if you were to replace the word love throughout this passage, if you were to replace the word love with your own name, okay, and earnestly consider whether such a statement is true. Earnestly judge each statement as you read it. And I'll go ahead and be the guinea pig in this, but I'll make a deal with you. You've got to be really, really quiet as we do this. So, 
so that you can hear my wife laughing all the way back in the nursery. <laughs> Joey suffers long. Joey is kind. Joey does not envy. Joey does not behave rudely. <laughs> Joey believes all things. You know, 17 years in journalism knocked all the benefit of the doubt out of me. <laughs> and I've been recovering ever since. Joey believes all things. Joey never fails. And plug your name in here. It doesn't take long for any one of us to realize how very short we each fall of what's being communicated here. If you can get past even three of these before the statement proves to be utterly false, I figure you're doing pretty good. And if you're thinking, I don't know what this guy's talking about, at least five of these things are true of me. Love is not puffed up. <laughs> Love does not parade itself. It's a, it's a convicting and a sobering exercise. You know, and it's one that should drive every honest soul here to repentance. You know, Lord God, this section, it does not speak of who I am. It does not speak of how I've been living before you. It doesn't ring perfectly true of my relationship with you right now. And as I read through here, I realize I am woefully lacking in all of these. And it drives us to let go of our flesh in an exercise like that. We plug our name in. We realize how very much our name doesn't belong there. We let go of our flesh, just like we've been seeing through this whole letter, and just continually, you know, okay, I'll lay that aside. I'll set that at the feet of Jesus. I'll let Jesus deal with this. Plug your name into this section. It drives you away from yourself, always. And because one with even the slightest shred of discernment here will readily acknowledge, hey, I don't measure up to any of this. My name doesn't belong here. <laughs> and that's an accurate statement. Our names don't belong there. But on the other side of this, if you were to supplant the word love throughout here with the name of Jesus, Jesus suffers long. Jesus is patient. Jesus is kind. Jesus does not envy. Jesus does not parade himself. Jesus is not puffed up. Jesus does not behave rudely. Jesus does not seek his own and Jesus is not provoked. And Jesus thinks no evil. He does not rejoice in iniquity. He rejoices in the truth. And Jesus bears all things. He believes all things. He hopes all things. He endures all things. Jesus never fails. You hear it and you know the deep truth of it. Every single statement, when you put Jesus' name in, it rings with hope and promise and depth because that's exactly who our Lord is. And for as miserably as we each fall short of each statement, and for as much as that rightfully, rightfully drives us to repentance, when we then reread the same section through the scope of his name, and just as, as we hear the full and perfect realization of each statement, it drives us into his arms. It sends us running to him. It draws us closer and closer to him. And, that, and that's the thing in all this. We say this so often. You cannot manufacture a love like this. You can't. So don't you dare walk away this morning thinking, I need to try harder. I need to do better. Or that I need to aim higher. Because you will fail and you will fail, and you will fail. Now, this type of love that we read about today, a love that rings true with these words, again, it's not just an aspect of our God, it's that our God is this love. He is this love. And as we've returned to frequently in this letter, what you're looking for in life, and that the life that you want to live for Jesus Christ, it doesn't come through better effort. It comes through drawing closer to him. It comes through putting more of him on over your life as you leave behind more and more of yourself. He is the love that so many aspire to. Put on more of him, and this love will begin to flow out of your life. And it will be absolutely and entirely of him when it does. You will overflow with this type of love. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. 
So if you have been crucified with Christ, which is to say you have given your life unto the service of the cross he died on for you, if so, it is no longer you who live, but Christ who lives in us. And if that is so, this is the love that will flow out of your heart. So the question here is not, can you love like this? You know, don't go home, start getting after your spouse or or, or your kids or or your parents. Why don't you love me like that? (laughs) I mean, see this this morning. This This is the love that God has for you. And then a love that only our God can produce. It's the love that God has for your spouse. It's the love that God has for your kids and for your parents. It's the love that God has for your (laughs) in-laws. It's the love that God has for your co-workers. It's the love that he has for your neighbors. This is how he loves. And that being true, the question to ask is, does that love then live in you? Have you invited that love to live in your heart? Does Jesus dwell there? And if he doesn't, invite him in. Let him live there. Let that love live in your life. If, that, if you want that to be true of your life, come up after the service. We'll pray with you. You know, But every single one of us is going to come up short when we read through a section like this. Less so than we did 10 years ago. Less so than we did yesterday. You know, and Less so than we did getting our family out the door for church this morning. But always, there will be room for more of this love in your heart. There's not a single one of us in this room that can't use more of Jesus in our lives. And every single one of us, always, we can run to him all the time, anytime. And Jesus, I need more of you. Dwell in my heart. Take over more than you had before. And make this type of love grow in my life. He is faithful always to answer that prayer. Ask him and watch what he does. <laughs> he is faithful to make that happen in measures we can't begin to comprehend. We leave behind more and more and more of ourselves. And patiently, steadfastly, we put on more and more and more of him. And in that, he just starts being what others see in your life. They see him. They never even think to put your name in a section like this. They just see the truth of the love that he has through you having put him on over your life. So let's do that. No closing song today. (laughs) We'll go ahead and pray, and I'll dismiss you from there. Father God, we, um, again, we realize how very faulty we are. (laughs) And in that, we're we're left further in awe of the love that you have for us, that you saw fit to provide um, the table that you bring us to, the banquet that your son is to us, the the flesh and the blood that saves us, and that forgives us of our sins, that, that grants us eternal life, Lord. And so we just, we, we come and we partake again. And we, we Lord, as we head into this week, we, we just ask that you be leading each one of us. And for as much as we want to love like this, Lord, we realize that only you can love like this. So something has to happen. And Lord, you have to overwhelm more of who we are. You, you have to take over more of our hearts. And so in that, we surrender what's left. We surrender the pieces that we've been holding on to. Lord, the pieces that you've been trying to address with us for, for years. Now, the anger and the bitterness and the, the cardinality that just tends to hang on, Lord, the things that, that you've wanted us to be free from, we ask, Lord, that you'd free us and just fill those places with the whole of who you are so that the world would see you, that they would see that type of love in our lives. Not that they'd be driven to remark about how loving we are, but how loving you are. And Lord, we just want the world to see you, and you have a plan for each one of us here this week. You know the people you want to reach through us. You know, Lord, whose hearts you've been moving on and and what words are going to fit in exactly the right spots to just unlock everything that you've been trying to reveal through your Holy Spirit, Lord. We we just surrender ourselves to the work you want us to do. We look forward, Lord, to the way that you're going to use us. We ask, Lord, just that you be forgiving us of the ways that we do fall short, the ways that we do sin, Lord. And you just be drawing us closer into your presence, that you be filling us with more of your Holy Spirit and and that there would just be a remarkable, things that, a remarkable thing that happens through that, Lord. And that you'd just be glorified and magnified in each one of our lives. So we thank you again for who you are. We, just, we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed. <laughs>